So if we can't measure residual volume directly, how is it we do it? We have to have some mechanism by which we measure it indirectly. Okay, there's three ways of doing it, and I'll explain briefly each of those. First of all, it's helium dilution. Basically, you start with a known helium, and they breathe until you reach equilibrium. And based on how it's diluted, and there's a formula we'll talk about here in a minute, no, you don't have to memorize that formula. Um, and, and based on how it's diluted and how much of a percentage reaches equilibrium will help you determine approximately what your residual volume is. Nitrogen washout, on the other hand, is based on the fact that 79% of what's in the RV is nitrogen. So you wash that out and you take a look at your exhaled nitrogen and divide it by 0.79, that'll kind of tell you what the RV is. And the last one is the body plasmography. It's also referred to as the body box. Body box is easier to say than body plasmography. Um, it applies to Boyle's Law, and it is the most accurate of the three. The other two, helium dilution and nitrogen washout, can only measure with communicating airways. If you have significant air trapping, the helium is not going to get there or the nitrogen is not going to wash out. Therefore, you can't measure those. So it's not 100% accurate. When we measure the RV, it allows us to calculate the total lung capacity in the FRC. Okay, and this box here is one that I put together out of a different, um, a different um, book to kind of help you look at. We can measure for helium dilution, nitrogen washout. Don't get caught up in the open circuit, the closed circuit, and all that. We'll talk a little bit more about that in class. Um, you can measure your FRC. Um, single breath nitrogen washout, you can do total lung capacity. Single breath helium, you can do total lung capacity. Um, plasmography, you can do your total thoracic gas volume, including that air which is obstructed. Okay, that's key because it's the most accurate. You can actually determine total lung capacity by doing a chest x-ray and they look at the anterior, the posterior, and the lateral and, and there's there's um, certain calculations they'll do, the radiologist does that. It is not something that you you have to do but it's important to recognize that you can determine your basic total lung capacity even with a chest x-ray. And when we talk about helium dilution we're going to do what's called a closed circuit multiple breath helium dilution. It uh, measures indirectly by diluting the gas with several breaths. Basically, you have a spirometer that is filled with a known volume of air. The helium is added. There's a certain concentration, usually about 10%. And um, basically what happens is the patient will breathe through a valve uh, that allows the there to be some rebreathing. And based on that, when helium reaches an equilibrium, and I have a picture here I'll show you that hopefully will help you, um, you can kind of determine how much air trapping there is or how much lung volume there is. I take that back, not air trapping, how much lung volume there is. In most people, it takes about three minutes, um, but if you've got somebody who has a lot of maldistribution, um, it may take longer than that, such as in COPD. Now, you see this formula here, and you probably want to freak out. Don't get overly excited about this formula. Basically, I just put it up here for you to see that it's based on a known volume and a final helium. You start with a, a known volume, an inspired volume, a final helium, and uh, a known uh, volume of helium, and between what you started with and when it reached equilibrium can aid in determining what your lung volume is. These two, this one and nitrogen washout, are two probably the hardest for RTs to understand. Now this picture here is basically trying to show you what I was trying to explain to you. If you look at the top left hand picture, your lungs have no helium in them. Okay, You open up a valve and you'll see in the second picture up on top that helium is moving to the lungs because we've opened up that valve. 
And finally, once equilibrium is reached, we reach this final helium reading, and then through calculations, you determine what long volume is. Okay, you have a certain volume of air and helium that you start with, and then you look at the end when it reaches equilibrium. Now, I'm, I'm trying to make it as simple as I can because the truth of the matter is you're not going to go through and calculate all this stuff anymore. We used to do that. We used to have to look at what is our initial helium reading. Then we'd open the valve, and then we would go for so long until there's no changes in the helium. We would have to get those two results and do a mathematical equation. It doesn't work that way today. This is not a test that you as a novice RT are going to walk out of this program and be able to go do efficiently and, and correctly without some additional training. Okay, So that is basics of helium dilution. We will touch more on it in class. Now we look at nitrogen washout. This is what they call an open circuit multiple breath nitrogen washout. These two where we use several breaths is the most accurate. It basically uses a non-rebreathing circuit. You don't rebreathe your CO2. We're assuming that there's 78% nitrogen, 79% nitrogen in the lungs. And we have the patient breathe 100% oxygen for several minutes while we wash out the nitrogen. There is a formula down below that looks at minute ventilation, <clears throat> excuse me, exhaled um, nitrogen, and it's based on how long it takes and how many breaths and what the volume is. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more in class. And something I want you guys to be thinking about is... Um, what do you suppose might be a problem with this particular test with certain types of patients? Potential problem, okay? Um, not only a side effect that might not be good, but why might it be difficult for us to get a good reading using 100% oxygen? Why would a helium dilution test actually be probably a little bit more accurate than a nitrogen washout? Um, Think about that because I can assure you you're going to be getting some questions in class about that. Here is just showing you basically you you start with the lungs before the nitrogen is washed out and you have a certain amount. You get 100 percent oxygen. And the exhale gas is is measured and, and collected and um, they just look at what the actual volume is and then there's some calculations. No. You do not have to memorize all this mathematical formulas. That's not what this is about. It's just for you to under the basic principles, to understand the basic principles of helium dilution versus a nitrogen washout test. Next, let's talk about body plasmography. Body plasmography is based on Boyle's law. Okay, if you remember Boyle's law, uh, P1V1 equals P2V2. So when you have a change in volume, you're going to have a change in pressure, okay? If you have a change in pressure, you're going to have a change in volume. That's Boyle's Law. Um, this test is becoming the standard um, to do because it is very accurate. It does not require uh, helium. It does not require 100% oxygen. Um, you can, can measure it a breath or two, um, and it's, it's relatively easy to do. Um, you can measure all gas volumes, including that which trapped in the alveoli. Um, you can actually have the patient do some panting. And that panting, the shutter is closed and, and there's a shutter in there that will measure volume and pressure changes. And they'll pant and when the shut, shutter closes at end expiration, there's no flow possible. You'll have airway pressure changes at the mouth that are assumed to reflect the same chest as, uh, pressure changes at the alveoli. And basically, to, to put it in a nutshell, it's looking at everything. It's looking at the changes in the volume in the cabinet versus the changes of the volume in the thoracic cavity uh, versus the changes at the patient's mouth. Uh, changes the patient's mouth pressure and cabinet air volume are measured looking at barometric pressure. Um, it's it, The easiest way that I know to explain it to you is not going to be here or even in class. It's going to be to take you uh, where they have a body box, which we'll be doing as part of this class, 
and and showing you what I mean. Um, I, it's hard to explain it until I can show you some things that will make a difference for you. Okay, so just right now, just to understand that there are three different ways, and that body plasmography is the most accurate of all. Um, this is just kind of showing you some pressure changes and looking at your pressure volume. It's a relationship of pressure and volume changes. That's what Boyle's Law is. I don't want you to spend a lot of time analyzing this picture at this particular point in time. When we're at the body box, I can explain this to you a little bit better. It has three major advantages over gas dilution. One, it's not affected by gas trapping, so that means that you can measure even that volume that's trapped, which means you're going to have a much more accurate RV. Okay? It's very rapid. It doesn't take several minutes and several breaths. It's easily repeatable. With helium dilution and nitrogen washout, you're using gases, and that means that when you need to repeat it, you've got to wait until all that nitrogen gets back in the lungs and, and the extra oxygen gets out of the lungs or the helium is out. So there's a time factor. The biggest disadvantage is cost. However, even that is becoming uh, less and less of a disadvantage today because prices have come down a little bit, more people are using it, more demand, and they can charge differently for it. Um, so, you know, the, the, it, the cost is a factor, but patient care and really knowing what's wrong with your patients and, and getting accurate results is even more important. This here is just a picture showing you kind of how the body box works. Looks at the relationship of volume and pressure. Uh, there's pressure transducers in there. There's flow transducers ducers that, that look at all that. It has a new attack graph that measures all those things. And it can it measure that relationship of pressure and volume changes. And what does all this mean? Well, when you have an increased total lung capacity, and your RV is increased, you're going to have an increased FRC. With an increased RV and FRC, you're going to have an increased TLC. Okay. When you have a restrictive impairment, these are going to be reduced. Okay. Just looking at tidal volumes alone cannot tell us enough a lot of times. That's why we need to look at total lung capacity. Um, we look at vital capacity, and then you figure if your normal total lung capacity is about 6 liters uh, and a normal vital capacity is about 4.8 liters, then you have about 1.2 liters dedicated to residual volume. Uh, it does vary some with age, gender, height, and ethnicity, but that's just the basics of it there. So there's a percentage of your total lung capacity that should be dedicated to residual volume. The greater that is the more air trapping you have going on. So here is kind of showing you that box that I preach about all the time and the relationship of what can happen in a restrictive lung disease versus an obstructive. In the middle is your normal and to your left you'll see the restrictive thing. Notice that everything is just reduced. Proportionately they're about the same but they're, everything is reduced. Whereas, when you get into an obstructive lung disease, look at how significantly large your RV is. And that is because of significant air trapping, which has increased your total lung capacity. If the air trapping gets severe enough, you can almost get a restrictive looking pattern in your uh, IRV and your tidal volume. Because think about it the more full your lungs are, now try breathing above that. So you can almost have a combined effect simply because of air trapping alone. Okay, And we'll demonstrate that some in class, and I'll have you do it some different breathing maneuvers, and hopefully it'll help you understand that particular instance where an obstructive air trapping lung disease can lead to a restrictive process as well.